uh, Stanley was really quite involved, quite passionate about photography. As Stanley, you must understand, was by the, the general lights of the time, a, the son of a wealthy person, as they had their own home. And they could have a, uh, a dark room. And uh, uh, his father was interested in photography, and I think he encouraged Stanley to use the dark room and to become a photographer. That dark room background actually was one of the bedrock things that enabled him to develop a very high level of sophistication about photography and then finally cinematography. Stanley was fascinated by photography. He was the photographer on the school newspaper and was constantly on the lookout for pictures that would capture the imagination. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. A press association has just announced that President Roosevelt is dead. Roosevelt was a god to us. That's what my mother said. She said, I'm not sure there's a god when he died. And then when he took that picture, whoa. It just made everybody that saw it would cry, that just start to cry. He, he looked like just the world had ended. And Stanley just got that. It was this photograph of a news vendor mourning the death of President Roosevelt that transformed the amateur into a professional. Stanley was just 16 when he sold this picture to Look, one of America's great illustrated magazines. When he graduated high school, he joined Look as a staff photographer, taking thousands of pictures, perpetually experimenting and gaining valuable experience for the next stage of his career. Kubrick shot several features on boxing for Look. One on the rising young fighter, Walter Cartier. Passionate about the sport, he realized he had found the subject for his first film. Day of the Fight was Stanley's first effort at filmmaking. I was his assistant on that. And uh, I'm very proud of the fact that I operated the second camera during the final fight sequence, which is a real fight. And uh, we were alternating with each other. I was uh, shooting when he was loading. Uh, I got the knockdown because Stanley was loading. He's done it. He's KO'd Bobby James. This is a fighter, Walter Cartier. He's just moved up one more place in a line that may end with a championship. Following Day of the Fight, Kubrick quit his job at Look and devoted himself to making films. He moved to Greenwich Village and for the next few years supported himself by making short documentaries, hustling chess in Washington Square and playing tournaments for prize money. But chess winnings were never going to be enough to fund an entire film. So in 1953, Kubrick's father cashed in his life insurance to help his son make Fear and Desire a film about a fictitious war. It was Kubrick's first feature. She'll see us. Shut up. He was absolutely and totally involved in the making of this movie. He knew nothing about acting. I probably didn't know much more. He was not a, a bohemian. He was not a, an avant-garde left bank figure. He was a kid from the Bronx who was smart. I don't think he had too much education. He was a very good chess player. It's the intensity impressed me. I, I thought he had a vision of someplace he was going. Fear and Desire 
was a youthful apprentice exercise. Kubrick would later withdraw the film from circulation, but he got him noticed and helped to get him financial backing for his next feature. Killer's Kiss revealed Kubrick's extraordinary ability to play with light. Stanley was making his second film, and I wanted very much to be the still photographer. So I also wanted to see somebody discovering, somebody learning. I knew I'd be seeing that. This was Stanley at a point where uh, he had no physical resources at all. On Fridays, he uh, dismissed the company for a couple of hours, went to the unemployment line and collected his unemployment check because that's what he was living on. It was $30 a week, and uh, it, he just about made it. He was very ambitious, and he knew that this was going to help him, because once there was a scene in the morning, and the crew wasn't paying, being paid much either, and everybody was in a bad mood, and Stanley said, well, why don't we just take the afternoon off? So I was amazed. Could he give us the day off? But he always drove me home. So on the ride home, I said, why are you always so nice to everyone? He said, honey, nobody's going to get anything out of this movie but me. <laughs> the theatrical release of Killer's Kiss brought Kubrick to the attention of James Harris, an up-and-coming producer who had access to finance. They teamed up to form Harris Kubrick Pictures. The only thing is, we didn't have anything to do at that time. <laughs> we had no subject to, to, to deal with. So uh, that night, uh, I left the office and uh, went to a bookstore and found a, a book there about the robbery of a racetrack. I don't suppose there's anything for dinner. Well, of course there is, darling. There are all sorts of things. We have steak and asparagus and potatoes. I don't smell nothing. Well, that figures, because you're too far away from it. Too far away from well, it? Certainly, you don't think I had it all cooked, do you? It's all down the shopping center. I thought he was a kid. <laughs> Both he and Jim were so very young. I'm guessing, but I think Stanley was only 26 at the time. I don't think anything was difficult for Stanley. He mm -hmm. had this tremendous confidence. And if he hadn't, I don't think he could have worked with Lucian Ballard as he had. The cameraman was Lucian Ballard. And Lucian had, I believe, won an Academy Award, was regarded as one of the top dozen or so photographers in the business, uh, and was a particularly stylish fellow. Married to Merle Oberon, a classic example of the old-style cinematographer Stanley really had done his own photography on the two films that he had done previously, so he knew exactly what he wanted. And I think that, that Lucian Ballard's kind of resented this young fellow from New York. The first shot of the picture, first day, first shot, Stanley set up a shot. It was quite complex. It was a long dolly shot. And he's lined it up specifically with a 25 millimeter lens. And uh, he set it up and uh, turned it over to Lucian. And Lucian said, fine, and began the elaborate business of lighting and setting a dolly track and so on. And Stanley went over to talk to Jimmy or do something and uh, looked back sort of over his shoulder and noticed that the dolly track was much further away from where he had set the camera. Uh, he said to Lucian, what, uh, uh, what are you doing, Lucian? Uh, I put the camera here. You're pulling it way back. Why haven't you put it where I've asked for it? He said, well, I, I haven't changed anything. Uh, I'm using a 50 millimeter lens to give you precisely the same coverage that you've asked for, but it's with the 50. And I've used the 50 because it makes my job a lot easier and it'll go a lot faster. And Stanley listened to this and said, but what about the change in perspective that occurs? He said, well, that really doesn't matter that much. That particular piece of information, of course, is dead wrong. The perspective changes. It's a different shot. And Stanley was aware that Lucian was simply bullying past him, 
But also what particularly nettled him was the assumption that he wouldn't understand this or wouldn't care about it. And Stanley said, put the camera where I told you with the lens that I asked for or get off the set and don't come back. He said it very quietly, very softly. And there was a look between them. And Lucian changed the setup and moved the camera where it had to be. And there was never an argument again about anything. All right. All right. Check it through. Passengers. Thank you, sir. Now I'm sure you'll find the service where you complete Airlines satisfaction. Flight 40, the New Englander. I suppose that a lot of what Stanley is and what he in more complicated ways did with later films is implicit in that rather simple little movie about this meticulously planned crime. This sense that the Sterling Hayden character has that he's really on top of that. He really knows what he's doing. And the fact that at the end of the movie, the little yapping dog gets loose and the prop wash goes and the money blows all over the place. I mean, it's sort of a brilliant movie. And it is an existential movie. I mean, that is to say, if existentialism basically posits that we define ourselves by doing and the chance is the one thing we can never quite fully comprehend prior to its impinging on our desires or our plans or whatever it is. It's a brilliant statement of that. The killing was not a commercial success, but the ingenious caper story did succeed in building Kubrick and Harris's reputation. 